And thank you for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Much of the northeastern U.S. enjoyed a white Christmas. The only problem, the snow kept coming, and with it, Arctic cold, setting records and creating dangerous conditions. Dill Hurt has the story. It snowed so much in Erie, Pennsylvania, that even those sent to clear the roads became victims of the winter weather. More than 60 inches of snow, a new record for the city, famous for its annual snowfall amounts. Whiteout conditions forced the city to declare a snow emergency. It was higher than a snowblower. Snow from the Great Lakes also buried Buffalo, New York. I could only do about 20 miles an hour. And following the snow, sub-zero temperatures that made it dangerous to be outside. The girls wanted to go ice skating and we tried, but it's really cold. In Duluth, Minnesota, temperatures hit 21 degrees below zero with a wind chill of minus 44, causing steam and fog to rise from Lake Superior. Treacherous ice and whiteout conditions sent dozens of cars spinning off highways. In Oregon, at least one driver was injured. Lost control, did a 360, hit a car on the next lane, and ended up here. Snowfall totals in parts of the Northeast could reach six feet. And meteorologists are warning the wind chill from record cold can cause frostbite after as little as 30 minutes exposure. Some folks in Wisconsin had to escape. They're going to Hawaii. Yes, yeah, so we're ready for 80 degree weather. Nervous our car might not start when we come back, but, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take it. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Health officials are warning this could be a bad flu season. The Centers for Disease Control reports high influenza-like activity in at least 10 states, mostly in the South and Southwest. More than 13,000 cases have been reported nationwide since October. One concern, this year's flu shots may not be up to the job, perhaps only 10 percent effective. Doctors say the flu can exist in the air as much as three to six feet away from the infected person. Doctors recommend getting the flu shot, though it is still not as powerful. It was a very Merry Christmas for the season's retailers. Year-end sales rose nearly 5 percent compared to 2016. That's the biggest increase in six years. That is according to a report by MasterCard. Online sales also took a big jump, rising 18 percent. And overall holiday spending hit a new high. One report claiming shoppers spend $598 billion this season. Analysts say confidence in a growing economy and lower unemployment helped to fuel the holiday spending boom. Israel's prime minister made a big promise for next Christmas. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu posted a special message on Facebook saying next year he will offer personal tours of the holy city for anyone who travels there for the holiday season. I'm going to take a guided tour. In fact, I'll be your guide on this guided tour. And think of all the places you can walk. You can go to the Jesus boat in the Sea of Galilee. You can get to the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulcher right behind me. Any places uh, that you want to visit in the footsteps of Jesus uh, and the origin of our Judeo-Christian heritage. The prime minister said the country will also protect the rights of everyone who wishes to worship in the holy shrines in Jerusalem. More countries may be following in President Trump's footsteps. At least 10 more countries' leaders are talking about moving their embassies to Jerusalem. That is according to Israel Radio. Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales is the first to announce his decision to move the country's embassy. Now the Friends of Zion Heritage Center hope to keep the momentum going and encouraging others to follow suit. They kicked off a global campaign and put up a banner in the holy city thanking the U.S. and Guatemalan presidents for their support. ISIS has lost 98 percent of the territory it once held. That is according to a Pentagon report. Half of those losses have come since President Trump took office. Critics say the Obama administration, quote, micromanaged the war and evaded a more intensive air strategy. Fewer than 1,000 ISIS fighters now remain in Iraq and Syria. That number is down from just 45,000 it was two years ago. The remaining ISIS strongholds are concentrated in a small area along the border of Syria and Iraq. A U.S.-led US -led coalition has recaptured nearly 100 percent of the land ISIS once held in the Iraqi city of Mosul. CBN News recently traveled there for an exclusive look at the Islamic State's epicenter. As Chris Mitchell shows us, it will take a long time to fix what ISIS virtually destroyed. CBN News, escorted by Iraqi National Police, drove where the fight against ISIS was at its worst. 
This part of Mosul remains a military zone littered with unexploded ordnance, IEDs, and dead bodies. We're standing in the center of Mosul and you can really see it's an apocalyptic landscape. Everywhere you look, you can see devastation and destruction. It's a bit eerie too, it's very quiet. It's like a ghost town. Reminds me of what a European city would have looked like uh, in World War II or after it was bombed out. And if you look around, you can tell it's not gonna take months or years, maybe decades to restore Mosul to what it once was. We stood within just a few yards of where ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared his caliphate in the summer of 2014. Now that three-year dream lay in ruins. His fighters, dead or gone. What we're looking at here, this devastation that we can see around us, is the price that it took to destroy that most uh, vile of projects that was declared in this city in June 2014, calling itself the Islamic State. This is the cost, this is the price, this destruction is what it took to turn that thing from a reality back into just an idea again. The Tigris River divides Mosul. Coalition forces bomb many of the bridges linking east and west. East Mosul still shows signs of life, but West Mosul bore the brunt of the conflict. One report says more than 9,000 civilians died in the battle to liberate Mosul from the Islamic State and left the city in ruins in the attempt to save it. We looked through this nearby church, a stark symbol of what ISIS sought to destroy. In Mosul alone, ISIS destroyed dozens of Christian churches and buildings. At one time, more than 10,000 Christian families called Mosul home. Now, just a handful remain. I'm standing at what used to be the center of St. Catherine's Church, and behind here was a convent for Dominican nuns. ISIS used this as their headquarters, and then it was destroyed by a U.S. airstrike. After ISIS took over Mosul, they used this place as their headquarters. They brought everything they stole from the people, their cars and their property, here. They used it as a factory for weapons and bombs. I can't express of my feelings, of my sad feelings about that, because I am comparing how it was before and now how is it, and not the buildings, but the act of the Dominican sisters. Johanna says the Dominican sisters served as salt and light to Mosul. You know, this convent for all Christians in Mosul has a big importance because the people of Mosul knows the Dominican sisters, they established many schools in Mosul and all the people now who are in good position in Iraq, they are graduated from these schools, especially in Mosul. For that, the Dominican sister had good reputation in Mosul. His humanitarian organization provided food and relief to Sunni Muslims here when the city opened up. We were here uh, when they bombed the minaret of uh, Hadba. In the same day, we are distributing here foods for families. And they asked us, we threatened you, we killed Christians, and now you are helping us. We didn't understand that. Dr. John uh, from CSI uh, was with us. He told them that is Christianity. They love their enemies and you are not their enemies. You are victims of ISIS as Christians. For that, we are here to help you. While much of Mosul lies in ruins, Yohara hopes for a better future. I hope that Mosul one day become as it was before. That is my dream. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Mosul, Iraq. Continuing in Mosul, Christians celebrated their first Christmas service since the city was overtaken by ISIS four years ago. Dozens of Chaldean Christians attended the mass amid tight security at St. Paul Church. Louis Seiko, head of the Chaldean Catholic Church, called on Muslims to change their way of thinking towards the Christian faith. U.S.-backed coalition forces drove ISIS fighters from Mosul last summer. Turning now to North Korea, a soldier who defected in 2017 was found to have traces of anthrax in his system. That is according to the South Korean news agency. UPI authorities say the soldier had developed an immunity to the disease, though he had not been vaccinated. The discovery raises concerns that North Korea is developing biological weapons. The revelation comes as the U.S. announced it's putting new sanctions on North Korea, targeting two senior officials in its ballistic missile program. 
Still ahead here on CBN Newswatch, there are 70 million deaf people worldwide and less than 2% of them have a Bible in a language they can understand. See how Wycliffe translators are now reaching deaf people around the world with Word of God. Imagine not having a Bible in your language. That's a reality for about 2,000 languages across the globe. Now it's in its 75th year, the world-renowned Wycliffe Bible Translators continues its work at reducing that number. One of their newest missions is reaching the deaf. Mark Martin has this story. For 75 years, Wycliffe Bible Translators have put God's Word into various languages around the world. The scriptures clearly state that the Word will go forth to all people, all nations around the world, and then Christ will return. And God has it all planned out. And the fact that he chooses to use an organization like Wycliffe to help bring about his plan just encourages me. While the numbers are also encouraging, much work still needs to be done. The organization says up to 160 million people need the Bible translated in their languages. But when God's word becomes alive in the language that you use at home with your family, and then you see that God speaks your language, you realize this is not someone else's message, this is a message intended for me. And it becomes foundational to all other things that the church does. One new frontier is the deaf community, and Wycliffe's working with Deaf Bible Society to reach this often overlooked group. We believe that they are a part of the Great Commission's command, and they too do have a right to know God's truth. The need is great. Deaf Bible Society estimates there are 70 million deaf people worldwide and less than 2% have interacted with the Bible in a language that they can understand. It doesn't stop there. Of the more than 350 sign languages, Pagan tells CBN News not one has a complete Bible translation, even American Sign Language or ASL. Some may wonder, why doesn't the deaf community just read a printed Bible? What many people don't realize is, as hearing individuals, we um, grow and are raised in the environment and context of a noisy world. Um, we have sound all around us. That, for us, is developing language. It's developing what we use to learn to read and to write later in life. For a deaf person, they don't have that experience. Pagan calls sign language the heart language of the deaf. It's how they communicate best. It's how they understand best. And I think that the Lord wants to communicate with us best. He wants to, us to understand Him. And He wants that for the deaf community as well. So why not give them scripture in their heart language? Why not translate the scriptures in a format that they can understand and offer videoed content that they can have on technological um, devices? Director of Operations Aidan Burke talked with us about the importance of this translation effort through interpreter Misty Sir. And when I was growing up, I saw so many different uh, churches where I'd see people signing directly from the Bible in English. And often there are misconcepts that are, you know, misconstrued as to what the actual meaning is. And so I always struggled with that growing up. Burke is encouraged by recent progress, specifically for ASL. Once a translation is complete, the Scripture Engagement Department steps in. Then they focus on um, knowing how to use that translation. How do we apply it? How do we teach it to the community? Um, it could be different ways of applying what they have. It could be on the app, on, the, on their phone. We caught up with Brandon, who demonstrated the Deaf Bible app. So you can see there's two different sections here. One is called ASLV, and it's book by book of the Bible. And the other one is CBT, and that's more of um, Bible stories that are in a story format for deaf people to watch. Computer technology is essential to the process. Uh, so Sean Collins oversees the software program known as right Chameleon. Uh, we're using motion capture, so we're actually capturing the signer, we're tracking their motions, and we're putting it into a 3D avatar in a 3D environment. So this allows us to change the avatar to look like a local national or a biblical character in a historical environment. And in a visual language like sign language, this creates a lot of context. 
All this helps Wycliffe reach deaf people around the world with the Word of God. We watched field coordinator Severa Trevino make contact with a deaf translation team from Tanzania for the first time. I'm so excited. He told me he couldn't be in contact because they were having internet issues and we'd have to wait until next year. But now here we are. The Holy Spirit ordered that, that right as we were walking by, mm -hmm. that connection happened. <laughs> oh, I feel goosebumps, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Deaf Bible Society says so far 30 sign languages have portions of the Bible translated. The organization and Wycliffe hope in the next three years that 100 more will be added to that list. Stuart Thiessen says okay. Deaf people are usually the last people to learn what's happening in the world. Even with the Bible, we're still the last people to know. I'm very excited that we have the ability um, for deaf people to get the support they need now that we're making all these translations happening. Taking God's word to people from all walks of life and helping to usher in the return of Jesus Christ. In Arlington, Texas, Mark Martin, CBN News. Up next, we're sitting down with New York Times bestselling author and Fox and Friends host Brian Kilmeade for an exclusive interview. Stay with us. Brian Kilmeade is best known as one of the hosts of the popular morning show Fox and Friends, but the television journalist is also a big history buff and the author of the new book, Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans. I had the pleasure of sitting down with him in New York City for a conversation about why he chose this subject for his latest work. Your new book, Andrew Jackson and the Miracle of New Orleans, what prompted you to tell this particular story? Well, I mean, George Washington's Secret Six, I knew I couldn't tell the comprehensive life of Washington or Jefferson, but I thought if I could tell you about his spying, everyday Americans doing extraordinary things for a cause who did not want any acclaim, in fact, it was top secret till 1930, feel good about that. If I could look at Jefferson's life, I'm not saying I can do it, but if I could tell you one underappreciated thing he did, and that's take on radical terrorists uh, back at a time in which no one was paying attention and we had no Navy, and what the results were, I'd love to do that because it gives us perspective on what's happening. I think that's why people are interested. And then I thought, what's next, what's logical, and what to my mind is underappreciated? Mm -hmm. That led me to the Battle of Baltimore, Star Spangled Banner, yeah. uh, the War of 1812, I absolutely am fascinated by that war, and the Battle of New Orleans. And to me, upon further review, New Orleans won because we found out for sure the British planned on winning it, holding it, and not giving it back. Mm -hmm. And that would have stopped our growth. And that's why the Jackson win was so much more consequential than anyone thought. Is that why you call it a miracle? I do, because he did. Mm -hmm. And you know, he, the, the other thing that I think your viewers would definitely understand and appreciate is the fact that the Ursuline nuns played a major, Ursuline nuns played a major role. So you have these nuns from 1718 who were nervous when Jefferson finally bought New Orleans from Napoleon. They said, what are you gonna do with us? He goes, we'll leave you right there. Because I promise you, as long as America's in control, you're safe. Well, in comes this war, and word comes out that the British are terrorizing the whole entire East Coast. They're burning villages, horrible things to women and families who are not in this war, uh, no military there, but didn't bother the British. And they fear what's coming around the bend. So when Jackson shows up and assures their safety, and he knows if Jackson wins, they win, they say, we're gonna pray for you. And Jackson, to, to his dying day, said, the reason why we won that is because they prayed. They also made it a hospital, the convent. Yeah. And we're gonna have a special on Fox News called Andrew Jackson, Hero Under Fire, mm -hmm. at which time we visit the convent. And we see the hedges that were there, the, the old building that still stands, which has been converted to museum, where every January 8th, from, uh, seven, from 1815 till today, they go out and bang pots and pans to celebrate Jackson's win. So it's not up to us to decide whether they played a role. Jackson thought so, and 25 years later, he visited them and saluted those nuns. And my conversation with Brian continues tomorrow right here on CBN News. I will talk about the story of personal strength many may not know about Andrew Jackson. Stay with us, we'll be right back. For the next few months, you can visit a piece of Jerusalem history without leaving the United States. As CBN's Ben Kennedy shows us, it's a unique 3D experience through the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. The National Geographic Museum here in D.C. aims to take people to Israel. No, you don't need to fly, as it is a virtual journey to one of the most sacred places on Earth. Please, join me inside. 
Digital guides lead visitors on an expedition back to the time of Jesus. Built in the fourth century, this site believed by many to be Jesus' tomb underwent a historic restoration. As part of the project, National Geographic studied the site with painstaking precision and then documented their findings to share with the world. Some of our visitors have told us that they might never get to go to Jerusalem and this is, this is a way for them to experience a piece of the magic of that historic city. Please pick up your 3D glasses. What's unique is there are no artifacts in this exhibition. High-tech media takes travelers to the church and beyond. So you push the button. Using LIDAR, a combination of sonar and laser imaging, archaeologists explore the shrine without disturbing it. It basically beams a, a light beam, uh, a laser beam, about 100,000 times per second to document a structure or a building or a field. This exhibition uses some new technologies and new storytelling platforms that we are new to us. We've never done this before. And if you want to get a closer look of the church, you can put on a VR headset, which allows you to go inside and even explore at your own pace. In that digital world, guests can embark on a journey, walk around Jerusalem's old city, or explore where Jesus is said to have been buried before his resurrection. For me, it was the first time to work in a historic place that was also so sacred, so important. Bottom line, it appears the VR experience is pretty much for everyone, Christians and even those who want to look back on biblical history. For CBN News, I'm Ben Kennedy in Washington. Ben, thank you. It's now time for your Wednesday Word, and here's a thought to consider as we get closer to wrapping up another year. God does not wait until a new year to allow you to begin again or to start over. His arms and heart are open to you at any given moment. So if you're looking for a new start, don't wait until the stroke of midnight and 2018. You can make that new start today and in this very moment. With that word, make this a wonderful Wednesday. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about always at CBNNews.com. And we would love to hear what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do that by emailing newswatch at CBN.com. And of course, you can always reach out and touch us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. Have a wonderful Wednesday. We'll see you right back here. Come tomorrow. Goodbye and God bless everybody.